sorry. <laughs> Our first email. Uh, so, yeah. the, the, the second email is the first one. And, uh, I'm email two. <laughs> Loves that jokes. Uh, take it away, email one. <laughs> WebAssembly games, it's also very sexy. Let's talk about something thoroughly mundane. Uh, assuming I can get the screen resolution. Are you running DJ? Mojax. <laughs> <laughs> So, down to earth, as a lot of SQL service using warp, or perhaps more fancifully, the pleasures and the perils of the early adopter. <laughs> So we were given a pretty familiar assignment, uh, build an API, and have some magic backend service, and uh, for various reasons we had to interact with it from things like GUIs and customer systems. And one of the nice things is that we didn't get too many constraints on the technology we picked for it. Um, so of course we did it in Rust. Um, started out doing a um, TypeScript prototype, but Simon thankfully convinced me to switch to Rust because we wanted to, uh, could get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we rationalized it to ourselves. We figured out that we have some code we might want to share with other organizations. Um, so we wanted a minimal framework uh, that didn't tell us what to do. We wanted to figure out a way to build this in a testable way at um, all the different layers of the stack. And we didn't really have any significant performance requirements at, for this particular uh, service. Um, so we sat down in December and had a discussion about this. And this was the three options that Simon uh, uh, presented to me. And this was my reaction. <laughs> <laughs> so if you looked a bit into Rust web frameworks, you may not recognize any of those names. <laughs> uh, they're not household names if there are such a thing in Rust web frameworks. Um, but it turns out that there is a method to the madness. Um, these are all frameworks being built and designed by thoroughly credentialed people. Um, so we ended up picking Warp uh, by Sean McArthur, um, who also built Hyper, which is the, like the canonical HTTP client and server library in that and pretty much all other frameworks is built on. Um, and there's like 30 other uh, crates um, with glowing reviews. Um, to mention mm -hmm. one, uh, it also built a request library, which is a canonical high-level client library. The so warp is a 
slightly exotic framework. And um, even though I was a bit confused when I first looked at it, and uh, it ended up converting me in a big way because it made the, as I said, quite mundane task of building an application API a bit more interesting. Um, and what makes Warp different is that it really has a single fundamental primitive, which is the filter. And a filter can do many different things. Um, um, for instance, you can extract some data from the request, put it into the request context. You can combine filters with other filters. Um, and you can turn the request context into a response. And significantly, if your filter doesn't like the request, you can reject it and send it back up the filter graph or something else to look at. Um, is filters all the way down? Your routes are a combination of filters, parameters, constraints. Um, so to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here, there's a somewhat distilled, uh, excuse the pun, um, representation of this uh, core trait. Um, there are a few things here in that are quite fundamental. You have the and and the work combinators that you use to compose uh, filters into something new. And then you have the standard functional methods that you can use to uh, tr translate the request context into something else and hopefully eventually into something that work will accept as a valid response. Um, Otherwise, the compiler will get very, very mad at you. So here's an example of a simple route in warp. This is the first concrete filter that we're going to be talking about, the get filter. <coughs> uh, it's, it does pretty much what you would expect. It inspects the current request and it rejects it if it doesn't have the get method. Now we combine that filter with a path filter, which requires the first fragment in the path to be a user string. And then we specify that we expect an integer, and then we specify that we expect a, another static string. Um, so this is funky macro magic for yet more filters. Um, and what happens when we introduce a, path, a parent filter is that we extract some data from the request and we put that into the request context. And the request context is pretty much a tuple and you can add things onto this tuple and then you ask Rust to call a, a closure and you get those context contexts are locked, and um, then you are supposed to take that and return something back which can be considered a response, and there are all kinds of convenient trait bounds that, means that you can return things like strings, uh, but also much more complex things like futures. Um, so here's a slightly more complex example, we're using the post filter instead to look for post requests. We look for a path which has two separate parameters. Um, rather interesting syntax here that took me a little while to accept using the division operator in a macro like this, but it does have the beauty that you specify those explicit types and get those served up to your um, handlers. Um, can you so put you in your own types there? Yes, so you can uh, specify anything that implements the from string trait. And we have yet another filter here which extracts the body as a JSON. Um, 
And in this case, we're actually asking for a sort of JSON value, but uh, you can ask for, if you have something that is struct that implements the serialized trait, you can get warp to serve you in that particular <coughs> struct uh, immediately. And, uh, significantly for a real application, you can return anything which is into future from here, uh, which uh, you typically do want to do because you want to perform other requests or uh, query the database or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and in order to actually tie our routes together into a functioning application, all we have to do is combine them using the um, or method when we pass that to warp serve and we're up and running. So it really is quite beautiful in the sense that we have this very simple primitive and that we can build very complex things from. But how can we take this and build a production grade application from it? Um, well, it turns out that that's where the pains of being an early adopter come in. <laughs> uh, so, inspired by the fact that Warp has this functional feel to it, uh, we decided that we wanted to have a single factor, single regular function per endpoint, which doesn't take anything fancy as parameters, and which didn't return anything fancy. So here is a slightly obfuscated uh, real example of um, such a function. It accepts an uh, object uh, which allows us to query the database, uh, represented by the user repository trait. It accepts a JSON uh, web token struct, and for this particular method, uh, user ID. And then we use the repository trait to perform a query towards the database. We return an API error type if there is a failure, which is a type that we have introduced ourselves. Uh, if everything is, if we get a successful response from the database, we do some sanity checking and always returning API errors if uh, something is off. And Assuming everything is right, we return an API response, which is also one of our own types. Um, so, this types API response and API error is the sign that we arrived at after quite a bit of head banging and frustration. Because <laughs> Warp has this built in error handling system called Rejection. And if you try this out, you're going to, be, going to be very tempted to attempt to use it for your own error handling. But it turns out that that kind of breaks the design philosophy of warp rejection is you saying go back up to the nearest other option and try that instead. Uh, it doesn't really work out if you want to return good error messages, but you know that you're in the correct endpoint. So we define this API future trait as our standard return type from all these methods, saying that we're always going to return a future of an API response or an API error. And an API response is a simple struct which has a sort of JSON value and a status code. An API error is a struct of uh, different error conditions, which can be converted to an API response. Uh, so we get around the limitation of warp by um, always mapping our valid responses back to an um, API response in the end, and then as a, in the final stage, we can take the, um, our internal type, uh, a result of an API response and an API error, and regardless of whether it's a, um, a success or a failure, we turn it into an API response and turn that API response into a work reply object. Um, so this is what we end up with to actually tie this, tie such an endpoint into work. We have our own custom authenticated get filter, um, a path just like the ones we saw. 
then we call our endpoint from the from the closure and attach this and map the result through this uh, to reply uh, function. Um, sorry. So a custom filter is uh, quite simple to introduce. Um, it's a closure which returns some um, other filters. In this case, we return a combination of the pool filter, our authentication filter, and the get filter. And the pool filter is simply a convenient way for cloning the reference to the database connection and passing that into all of these endpoints. Um, the authentication filter is us checking if there is an authentication cookie and mapping that into the JSON web token. So this is what we end up with. Um, the leftmost part is the uh, work specific code, while the rightmost part is completely independent of any notion of uh, work as a framework. And even though we obviously do have a tiny bit of boilerplate on the left, it kind of stands out for me in the sense that there's, for boilerplate there's quite high information density to it. Um, it's mostly information that is going to be present either as configuration or code anyway. Um, I mentioned repositories, so um, I'm quickly going to say that this is how we approach the database access, declaring traits for uh, different database tables basically that's what we wanted to access um, for performing basic SQL calls and then we implement these traits directly on the database pool uh, no need to have some object um, uh, which holds a connection or anything like that in between uh, but the nice thing about this approach is of course that we can implement it for other things as well so, for instance, the read write lock of a standard vector. Um, and we use the read write lock here because this uh, mutating method is not except a mutable pointer, and the read write lock allows us to easily get around that. So, we end up with test cases that look like this. We set up a repository which is a simple vector and put the uh, user struct into it. We create a claims object representing our session and then we create a Tokyo runtime and simply call our method, get back a result and we can assert any property we want about it. Um, so this structure makes it incredibly easy to test every single endpoint and to provide everything that these methods require um, without relying on the single, single work specific type. Um, so in conclusion, work is really nice in the sense that it's so powerful and we really, that was the one thing that we really found over months that we've been working with this and when we encountered new requirements and had to change something and to add a static file server to it to serve a React app from a certain sub-path and there's a static file filter that you can tie into it and it fits, fits right into the picture. Um, it did take us a bit of experimenting to uh, figure things out though. Um, there's not a tremendous amount of examples online. Um, all the philosophical aspects of the design of this isn't uh, thoroughly documented. Um, so, for instance, uh, this thing about the reject rejections. Um, <laughs> people working with the futures are going to be accustomed to this already. Uh, work makes it even worse because you have you have the future errors. And you also get the work errors from all these uh, neatly nested the types. Uh, I think at this point that we had to uh, 
bump the next recursion left three times. And uh, have one buffer in the third. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, main advice, as I've mentioned to anyone who wants to try this out for their own, uh, don't be deceived by uh, trying to use the rejection for your own purposes. That's not what it's there for. Uh, and that's all I've got. Okay. I'm sorry? Are you using RLS? The language uh, no, not that. Okay. We're not actually. I'll check it out though. Uh, so I have a question. Like, you, in the end, do you feel that you were more productive? Or, is it, or was it just an even with all the drawbacks? Yeah, I think we're definitely reaping the benefits of the initial pain at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I don't know. Honestly, it's probably doubtful that we will ever fully retain the time that we lost figuring things out. <laughs> um, but, um, um, and, you know, um, sometimes you have to try new things too. What's the advantage of these uh, filters in compared to having just a series of if statements? I think that um, basically I'm advocating the, uh, immediate knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> usable, right? Yeah, 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 I think that it's it's kind of a, a classic imperative over uh, functional programming uh, thing that uh, you get um, very powerful composability of these uh, primitives. Um, so. If you're a believer in that, you're going to like it. If you're not, you're going to hate it. You're not going to be able to change your mind. About it. Yes. It's just a question connected to the previous one. <clears throat> Are the filters? Do the filters run like uh, in single futures? And in that case, do they run on the on a multi multi threaded executor in parallel? Potentially. Um, so there's a Tokyo runtime underlying this. So. So you have 10,000 requests coming in, and your request, each one, is not necessarily executed sequentially, but... Yeah, uh, as there, they there's going to be some theory of parallelism to it, uh, but uh, one of the things we had to do was that with the Postgres mm -hmm. client library we're using that's blocking, so we have to futurify that, put it on a separate mm -hmm. thread pole, and send the results back on the channel in order to not block the main uh, thing. So it's pretty standard thinking if you're working with an asynchronous server API. You have to design it in such a way that you rely on the futures to yield um, when you're waiting on something. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> but, um, maybe I can expand for the, the question as well. Uh, so its work is built on Hyper, and Hyper will spawn a futures task for each request that comes in. So, as long as you just return a future, it will drive that future for that HTTP request, and then you get uh, concurrency for free. So, what was the reason that you were using a, a mocking function for the database instead of like spinning up a Docker or a FML Postgres uh, instance? Because it's simpler to cover all the different branches. Uh, you don't have any logic in a database at all, then? Uh, we do, but we're well, uh, quite li a limited amount. We're not uh, big believers in stored procedures, but uh, we're also testing the repositories uh, separately, and we're running integration tests on uh, some aspects of the full application. So, um, this is mostly a way of making sure that we can easily set up test scenarios that allows us to cover branches that would be obnoxious to configure a database. Uh, to Trigger. 
uh, performance-wise, how, how the compile times and how is the debugger performance compared to what you're used to otherwise? Runtime performance is really good. The compiler <laughs> performance is completely awful. <laughs> what does completely awful mean? So I think that the, well, on my uh, desktop in Core i5 for, uh, from 2015, uh, it's maybe a minute uh, build time uh, at this point. Uh, and, uh, and in debug mode? I'm sorry? In debug mode? Yes. And that's uh, just a tiny change, or is it fuller build? Is it incremental with LLV? Or? Uh, it's a pretty standard setup. I don't think that the main culprit here is uh, warp itself, though, even though the, um, the reliance on the type system definitely contributes. Uh, the main problem is probably that we, we haven't broken this into multiple crates and we have a huge amount of dependencies mm -hmm. to it. And Rosotto in particular tends to make your build times go to hell. <laughs> And I think actually in this case, because we pull in quite a lot of crates for these web servers, it's actually the linker that takes up most of the time. Uh -huh. I think I measured it so like 50% of the time to compile the big project. If you use gold, it goes down to like 25% of the time. If you use LLD, I think it's even better, yeah. but I haven't gotten that working yet. Uh -huh. Any last questions? Have you any experience with the other uh, frameworks like Actix or uh, can you contrast with those? <coughs> uh, so we've been using Hyper directly quite extensively for our high performance applications. Um, um, it's, it works pretty well, but uh, it's obviously lacking some uh, high level primitives. So um, it's a bit inconvenient if you have a lot of different uh, endpoints and you're building a rather typical API. I, I think I used one other framework a few years ago, but I don't remember which one I think. Um, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to it. Uh, well, yeah, specifically with regards to Actix, there was a big debacle when uh, the Rust community discovered the unprincipled use of unsafe in the library. Uh, it was a bit of a horror story. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but they had to make amends. But but still, uh, there's a lot of unsafe in there, and it's, it's a bit, bit ugly, I think. Um, maybe it depends on how sensitive you are to stuff like that. But I think it's a rather reckless library, and I probably not touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>